Hey everybody, welcome to another Purple Insider Extra. Matthew Collar here, and I've gotten so many great Friday mailbag questions for our newsletter, which goes out every day, purpleinsider.substack.com, that I wanted to bring a few to our YouTube page as well, because Vikings fans have always got a lot of interesting thoughts. I put it out there on Thursday, and I say, hey, send me whatever you got, and I get 30, 40 responses, and I try to answer every question, so make sure you check out the whole thing. But I wanted to highlight a couple of them and hope we could do this every week where I take a couple questions that are sent in and we could talk about them here on YouTube as well. So let me call up our questions here in the screen share and we can get right to it. So let's start out. I've highlighted a few of these with uh, Kyle's question or Kai, I'm sorry, his question. He says stats on the defensive line shows that they appear to be struggling, but when I'm watching games, they seem fine. What is the disconnect? Now the Vikings uh, have produced a pretty good amount of sacks so far. So I think that, you know, maybe the defensive line has been a mix of uh, players who have really gotten off to a good start and guys who have not gotten off to that great of a start, whether it's either statistically or from the visual part of it. So I'll give you an example that Daniil Hunter has clearly, since the second half of the Cincinnati Bengals game, has done a tremendous job and he got a couple of sacks last week. He was chasing down Kyler Murray all day, it seemed, and he was the same dominant uh, Daniil Hunter that he always has been. On the other side, Sheldon Richardson has not yet been Sheldon Richardson. And we saw this in 2018 where he started out hot. Uh, he had some games where you felt like Sheldon Richardson just wasn't the, the same guy. And then he was dominant in other games. I remember Green Bay later in the season in 2018. It was a home game, national TV. Sheldon Richardson was all over Aaron Rodgers in that game. So we've seen more of the down starts for him in a rotational role. I guess we'll have to find out where it goes from there. Steven Weatherly has played pretty well so far. Michael Pierce has gotten a couple sacks in the first week. And I thought he was fine last week. As far as Delvin Tomlinson, that one might take a little more nuance, like stuffing gaps and holding blocks and things like that. Those are things that don't necessarily show up in box scores and don't get huge credit from pro football focus. Like they're not uh, these big splash plays. I think from watching back the tape, Delvin Tomlinson has been fine, but he's also adjusting to something new. He's lined up over the tackle on about half of his snaps against Arizona and maybe one third of his snaps against Cincinnati. That's not something that he ever really did before. It was always three technique and mostly nose tackle. So he's adjusting. I think overall the defensive line has been good. They got after Kyler Murray. You know, quite a bit last week. It's just that Kyler Murray found ways to escape. Um, so I think the stats from player to player, uh, DJ Wanham has not gotten off to a great start, uh, have been kind of a mixed bag, but that's a great question. All right, let's go to our next one here. From Ben, is KJ Osborne's strong start to the season a flash in the pan, or is this something that can continue all year? Uh, ben, I think that it can continue all year. Where... KJ Osborne started out in April looking like a completely different guy. He was terrific right from the beginning of OTA's mini camp. And I know that those things are just guys running around in shorts, but when you see live reps or semi live reps where cornerbacks are trying to cover receivers, receivers are trying to get their routes down and you see him making plays, it sticks out to you. And then through training camp, he was able to get that extra opportunity with Justin Jefferson out and he really rose to the challenge and played quite well. Now, their offense, because of Jake Browning and uh, Kellen Mond during the preseason games, had very little to show. Um, so I don't think that the uh, audience got to see as much of what we were seeing in practice on a day-to-day -day basis from K.J. Osborne. And so him carrying that over to these first couple of games, I don't think he ends up leading the team in receiving, but I do think that he could get 50 or 60 catches this year and become the weapon that they had hoped Irv Smith was going to be. Uh, the other thing about KJ Osborne, his personality is he's just known as someone who's very driven, very smart. Uh, he worked out in the off season with Justin Jefferson. I mean, he's a guy that had a really good reputation coming in. He was a captain at Miami after transferring there from the university of Buffalo. So I don't think that this is really a huge shock, and I remember talking with Lance Leipold, who was his coach in Buffalo, who said, don't underestimate KJ Osborne. And he's showing that now. Thanks, Ben. All right, let's go to our next question here. Which Vikings offensive player, current or former, would have made the best defensive player? Okay, this is a great question and, and a really fun one. I think on the present team, 
it's Justin Jefferson. And Delvin Cook was even asked this. Uh, Justin Jefferson could play defense at corner or mostly safety. I think his instinctual nature, his ability to play 50-50 balls, to close gaps quickly, and, and just kind of being a natural athlete would really transfer over quite well to safety. I'm not sure that there's anybody else on the offense that would be good defensively. Like Delvin Cook... He doesn't have those oily hips of a cornerback, and he's kind of thick and wide, not wiry like good cornerbacks have to be. I don't know that Adam Thielen would fit good at any other position or K.J. Osborne. Uh, maybe Tyler Conklin could be a linebacker. He has a linebackerish look to him. C.J. Ham, a fullback. Fullbacks can play linebackers, so there's that. Historically, I have two answers for you. One is Randall McDaniel, who could have been a linebacker, a defensive tackle, a defensive end. Randall McDaniel could have done just about anything. Uh, and Percy Harvin, I think we talk about the shape of a corner. He's got the shape of a corner, but also one of the most instinctual players that I think the NFL has seen in the last 20 years. It's just that other things, injuries and so forth, derailed his career. But uh, I think that Percy Harvin could have done just about anything on a football field. All right, next question. Daniil Hunter is obviously... Uh, gets to the quarterback regularly, but he doesn't produce as many fumbles as some other top pass rushers in the league. Well, this is uh, an interesting stati statistical, I don't know if it's an anomaly or not, because I, I looked up Vaughn Miller, who surprisingly only has um, six over the last couple of seasons, and Cam Jordan. And what do these guys have in common? They rush off the right side a lot. And I think if there is a difference between being the right, uh, rushing off the offense's right side and the blind side of the quarterback, it is those strip sacks, and Yannick Ngakwe was known for this. It was a big conversation when they traded for him. He's always rushing off the blind side, reaching for the football. And I think that does make a difference, that the quarterback, when he can see you and you're in his vision, that he's able to pull the ball down just in time. Because you can't really miss Daniel Hunter coming at you this way. But when you've got your back turned, if you're looking that way, you know, the ball goes back, you can reach it, slap it out of your hands. I think that's part of it. It might just also be that the Vikings uh, maybe, and I don't know this, but don't teach their guys to be jabbing out at the ball. They would prefer that they wrap up and get the sack. I mean, the numbers have shown that when a quarterback gets sacked, I mean, it's almost always a drive ender. So maybe instead of taking risks to try and knock the ball out, Daniil Hunter prefers just to take guys down. Um, I don't think that it is any sort of knock or maybe anything that he's doing. Um, I think it might just be the circumstance or randomness. Sometimes these fumbles, you could get five forced fumbles in a year and then zero the next year, like any kind of turnover. All right, let's go to our last question. Again, all of these in the Friday mailbag, and then there's many more in the Friday mailbag as well. What is the most overrated traditional stat on offense and defense? Uh, I have to think that it's passing yards and tackles. What's better, a new age? What is a better new age or analytic stat for each? Now, this is a, a good one because we're always looking at, well, you know, this team led the league in passing yards. And you remember Jameis Winston went over 5,000 passing yards when he also threw 30 interceptions as well. And so I think that passing yards is a good answer to this, but there's a happy medium. I mean, if you're only throwing for 3,000 yards in a season, that means your team doesn't really trust you very much. So you should be throwing for over 4,000 yards regularly in today's NFL. But if you're throwing for 5,000, it's possible that you either are Patrick Mahomes and you're driving the offense or you're driving them from behind. And we've seen that uh, here a little bit in 2020 as well with Minnesota. But especially, you know, I remember back in the day when quarterbacks rarely went over 4,000 yards, John Kitna went over 4,000. And I think they won six or seven games in Detroit that year because they were playing from behind and throwing the football a lot. So I agree with that. Tackles is another one that is a really good one because uh, you can rack up 200 tackles five, six, seven, eight yards downfield if you're a linebacker. And, and that doesn't mean that you had a great season. And so I think that, you know, one way you can use pro football focus statistics is you can look at the tackling grade because they're going to chart missed tackles and things like that. Um, so if you're one of the top rated tacklers and you're racking up a hundred tackles, you can kind of combine these the same with passing yards. Like if you use passing yards alone, then you're not getting a whole lot of information. But if you use passing yards and you're looking up quarterback rating and you're looking up uh, the passing grade from pro football focus, and they're all matching up saying, no, this quarterback was dominant. 
I, I don't think that uh, just playing from behind will do all of those things for you. And you can also look that up too. And how many yards were thrown for uh, when you're talking about playing from behind or playing ahead. Um, I think that it's combining some of the analytic stats with the traditional numbers to get a better idea. And the one I look at in terms of how an offense produced is expected points added, because that gives you an idea of how you performed versus the situation that you were in. And uh, in the last five years, all the Super Bowl teams were all in the top five and passing expected points added. So that tells you kind of what's important in the NFL. All right. Well, I can't uh, thank people enough for these questions. I, I, it's so much fun on a, a weekly basis to be able to, um, you know, send that tweet out there, get all of the questions from Vikings fans and to be able to answer them. So it's a thing that I want to continue to do on Fridays, make a little video uh, doing that. So feel free, follow me on Twitter at Matthew Collar, send me your questions. We'll try to get it in here as part of the uh, Friday mailbag on YouTube. And remember, look for our longer conversations, the Purple Insider podcast as well. Uh, we're putting them out every single day. So if you got a ride into work or you're working from home and you want to wake up to some Vikings talk, the Purple Insider podcast, the place to go. All right. Thanks, everybody.